So, um, so I'm a product manager at Booking.com. Uh, we have many, many different product teams. Um, but I just want to give the guys here the opportunity to, uh, to introduce themselves, first of all. So, so let's start off here. Hello. I'm Gabriel Radic. I work at Eat First, which is a rocket internet venture in Berlin and London. Uh, I've been doing product management for about 15 years now. Rohan Chandran. I work at Telenav right now as the GM of the mobile business, but my career was software developer, computer scientist, to product manager, to general manager. So hopefully that gives good context to this discussion. I'm Edin Mimishevich, head of mobile applications at uh, Food Panda, which is also a rocket company. Uh, we are running our business in more than 40 countries, meanwhile. And I grown up in the mobile business. So from uh, after I was finished with my studies, I started with uh, a pre-smartphone era, um, working on mobile products. Um, my name's uh, Felix Peterson, um, now based uh, in Lisbon. I'm a partner at uh, Faber Ventures, uh, a venture capital firm based out of uh, UK and, um, and Lisbon. But before that, um, I have actually have been doing product management, um, both in my own companies, um, Places and, and Amen, um, and also um, for a while at, um, at Nokia. Um, yeah. Cool. Thank you, everyone. So, uh, so the general theme, uh, I suppose, is what do successful companies do differently? Um, but one of, the, one of the questions I get asked the most by the, the fabulous engineering talent we have at Booking.com is what do you actually do? Um, so, uh, Rowan, do you want to kick off and, and just you know, give the perspective on, on what product management actually means to you and your business? Sure, that's, that's the bane of product managers everywhere is everyone's asking, like, what do you actually do with the product because you're not the person building it? So I boil it down to, I think, three, three jobs that a product manager has, and one of them's infinite, so that's kind of a little cheat. And, and I, I borrow this classification liberally, liberally from a guy called Adam Nash. Um, he's currently the CEO of Wealthfront, which is a great new company that I admire in the Valley. He's been a great product manager at eBay, LinkedIn, and other places, and he, he led a lot of the development of LinkedIn from a product perspective. Great guy for all of you to follow on Twitter and to read his, his blog posts about product and business thinking in general. And, and the way he breaks it down, and I break it down, this is kind of a combined thought, is the first job of a product manager is to define the game you're playing and how you keep score. And essentially that boils down to setting a context for the whole team as to what you're doing and what winning and success means. And that means that at any point in time, the engineering, the UX, the QA, that the whole team you're working with can sort of look up at, at some kind of a, a virtual scoreboard and understand, are we winning or are we not? What's the gap from here to winning? And what game are we playing? So how do we figure out what we're going to do to win, right? Because if you're playing soccer, it's not much help if one of your teammates decides to you know, impersonate Simona Halep and, and come out with a tennis racket swinging. It doesn't help you get towards your Goal. So that context strategy essentially is what we're saying is, is number one. Number two is the, the most difficult job for a product manager and the most critical one. And you know, as product manager, as CEO of a startup, a founder, this is really what you're doing. It's prioritization. And this boils down to understanding that there are so many different things you could do, all of which potentially have great value, but choosing the right one at the right time in the right sequence. And, and so the ability to say no I'm not going to do this, and as a team, we're not going to focus our energy here, even though it sounds exciting and appealing and sexy and everything else, becomes critical. The third job of the pro product manager, which is, I think, the reason a lot of the questions get asked as to what do you really do, is to be that facilitator to get us over the finish line. And that means doing whatever it takes to support the team. So you might be playing finance guy at one point, you might be playing QA guy at the next point, you might be playing UX person sketching up wireframes at another time. You have to do all these things to support the team because you're ultimately the, the leader and the facilitator to make it all happen. So one, one thing you forgot is uh, the salesperson. Yeah? <laughs> So even, uh, even if you're a product manager and doing all the things you have at the end to sell your, feed, uh, your feature and things you want, you have to sell them internally because you have, you're dealing with so many different uh, groups of interests, even in your own company. Yeah, when you're bigger, you have more groups. And that's it. You have your stakeholders and you have to sell the thing you want. You think, you, you think it's the, the right feature to sell it also internally. Yeah, that's, that's actually an, um, 
an uh, interesting development we've we've been seeing I, I think in in in, in large organizations um, that are a little bit further down the road like 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 Facebook or, or Dropbox um, the, the the way the way they do it and I think it's a very interesting way of approaching it is basically um, you're not upselling your ideas you're um, you're you're creating almost a company within the company and you're selling traction right so um, you actually have to assemble your team to a certain um, point yourself and rally it around you. So it's not how it used to be that you set up an idea and then there is a top-down mandate and this is the five people that need to listen to you no matter if they want or not. But you actually, there is a lot of, in larger organizations, they find ways of um, little ideas popping up here and there whether it's to a product manager or to a designer or even a developer, and then releasing it to, um, to a certain degree to, uh, to an internal audience or a smaller external audience in like a closed beta. Um, and then as a product manager, um, I think, you know, better, basically, there's no excuses anymore. You're, you're, you're form, your foremost job is to win, right? And the cool thing about it is you get the resources to do it. You're almost like an entrepreneur. Um, but you also need to win, right? There's no excuses. You're kind of a generalist, and, and like Rohan said, you need to do, um, you need to assume whatever role it takes uh, to win, and that's also that's that's the great part about it, but also also the hard part. But I like this idea of sort of actually having to build up internal momentum, um, and then just saying, look, you know, we've tried this with 200, 300 of our users, and it actually seems to work. So um, that gives you momentum to get more resources and 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 to uh, develop some gravity around around the project um, I think that's 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 sort of a great way of of, of doing it in, in large organizations because that's essentially what you do when you're a small startup too yeah well, you if I may add just one thing is um, well, how I see the product management the job itself is you are basically the translator the communicator between the founder or the CEO of the company and the people actually working on it and it sounds like a trivial job you're like a, some, somebody's secretary but it's, it's actually quite important because you realize in the day you go on vacation for two weeks, you come back and you see like frustration in both, both sides and you see, realize, okay, it's, this is actually important what I'm doing here. So that's, that's like a, a big, big uh, uh, epiphany in a way to, to, to come back and see, okay, I'm needed here and they basically, thanks for coming back. That's always like a, such, a, such a nice, nice feeling to, 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 to have. Uh, and also just mentioning this, being the translator, communicator between the, the two sides, the decision makers and the, the visionaries, if you want, who come up with a business plan, with a strategy, with a, a marketing approach, and the guys actually implementing and building the, the thing, is uh, you want to make sure you are close to both of them. I mean, you have to make sure you, are, you have some decision uh, power. You want to make sure you are close to the, the founder or to the CEO, and you want to make sure you are part of the development team. That's like the, one of the important things that I've seen in, in successful, successful companies. Mm -hmm. so, so let's focus on that. Um, I think it's very important. So, you know, we, we kind of touched on communication there. And, um, and at Booking.com, as we grow, and it just keeps on growing and growing, the, the, the thing which, would like say, like one of the key qualities we always look for in product managers is this, this communication skill. Because we're going so fast and we're adding so many new teams, being able to communicate very clearly and having the right communication style is, is one of the key things we look for in our people. Um, so maybe we can think about uh, or talk about what do you think are, what are the qualities, what are you looking for, how do you become and step up a great product manager? I mean, communication is one of them, but, uh, but uh, I guess these guys want to grow their own companies and they need to, these skills themselves. So, so what do you look for in a great product manager or how do you become one? Well, I, I think, you know, in order to end up with um, intention um, in, in a product manager and not just, you know, sort of incremental um, improvements to the product, you need to somehow, I mean, let's just say it's easier to turn, you know, a, a, a big thinker into a productive person than turning a productive person into a big thinker. And it might be a little bit my, my, my personal taste, but I would always go for, um, for people who have... Uh, you know, a slightly bigger perspective. So um, I would, what I, who I, for example, love hiring for um, uh, product managers is, uh, is, is entrepreneurs. I think that's, that's a great place to look. Not necessarily someone who's built a huge company before, but, you know, someone who's, who's proved resourceful by, you know, doing a, um, 
doing a, some kind of project that was successful, whether it was selling, you know, building an, an Etsy shop or, you know, doing something on the side as a student or doing, you know, doing, uh, uh, running some, some kind of small, small uh, non-profit or something like that. I'd, I'd always use, look for, for a resourceful uh, guys who, who can have a, um, who, who have slightly bigger ideas. I think that's, that's a good place to start. Yeah, I think I think resourceful is a is a great adjective to use to describe something that a product manager needs. I think in addition to that, when I'm is this on, when I'm hiring product managers, really looking for people who have strong personalities, strong convictions, and can back those up and can stand up for what they believe in. And this goes to the prioritization aspect. But at the same time, and this is difficult to find as, as a combination have a complete lack of ego to go with it because you, you're in that position as a product manager, right? You're not the person building the product. If you're out there looking for the, the credit and the due and, and that's your, your goal here to be recognized as the person who built this, that usually won't work out very well. So that, that combination is tough to find. I think in addition to that, to touch on the communication point, um, you, you need someone who has an understanding of different audiences, right? As we talked about the third, key thing that the product manager has to do is deal with all these different functions. And when you're speaking to salespeople versus speaking to engineers, you have to understand your audience is different. And even though you may be setting the same context for everyone, the way in which you need to position that and set that up is different depending on the perspective that that person has. So that ability to understand that perspective is huge. I think on day one, Philip and Florian were talking about recruiting in Cluj and having to recruit outside the IT industry. And, and I was thinking about that and thinking psychology would be a great background for people coming into product and UX design and so on because that understanding of human behavior is, is both an external requirement for the product but also an internal requirement within an organization, right? Because again, you're, you're leading an organization without the direct control and understanding human behavior becomes critical in achieving that. So also what I know when I'm hiring um, product managers, um, I'm searching for people that are not afraid to fail because um, to fail it's not, uh, not that bad thing because you're learning. Yeah? You're not afraid to fail. You will fail once, you will fail twice, but you will not fail third time. So just get up and do it again and see what, what did you wrong, fix it and go on. I agree because that actually builds uh, another important trait, resilience, right? Um, I mean, you really need to be look. For, you really need to look for people that are resilient. And sometimes, um, you know, having a, a couple of scars <laughs> in your biography can can really help. Um, I would also not primarily look for you know for a certain type of degree. Um, any people that sailed a little too easily through life. Um, Normally, make um, a, a less good product manager than than than, than people who've you know have walked away with some some battle scars. Because it's more about you. There will be resistance. There will be failure. There will be things you try, and there will be frustration. So the ability to pick yourself up, um, mm -mm. I think, is uh, is is extremely important. Uh, if, if I may, I just so what you described. I agree with everything you just said. I was about, actually about to say. Nothing. <laughs> that was just, just fine. But I just realized it's... So this, is, this applies a bit too broadly. I mean, if you hire somebody, you want to make sure they're smart and hardworking and they don't have a, too much of a big ego. So I think it's, it's great advice, but in a more actionable way, what you may want to look into like when you actually have somebody in front of you. So besides all these qualities, which to me and to everyone, it's, it's sort of obvious you want to make sure that those people are hardworking and they understand what they're doing. And, but concretely and in an actionable way, you want to look into somebody that can do some, some UI, some user experience, somebody that can, do, um, uh, put, can put together a sales presentation maybe, and somebody who is just nice to talk to and you, know, you want to be around them uh, because those guys are going to be part of multiple teams basically. So I'm going to disagree slightly just to make this yes. interesting. Um, I, I, I do agree with the last part of that, which to me speaks to you know, values and culture fit in your organization. And I think it's really more values fit than culture fit. I think that's a misused term. The, the technical skills of presenting all those kind of things, they're all important. But I think all those are ultimately coachable, trainable, and learnable. It's, it's actually the, 
the more foundational skills and, and the person you're looking for that become more critical because you can't really shift that, but you can shift the technical skills. So I, I, I would say I actually tend not to pay attention to that other than to look at past successes a person has. And this goes for hiring in, in any role. I think past success is the ultimate, ultimately the best predictor of future success. The other thing I was going to add is, as you, as you guys heard the descriptions of what makes a good product manager, if anyone was out there thinking, well, that sounds like the description of a startup founder and the skills they should have, mm. that's exactly right. right? That, that is probably your number one job as a startup founder is to be the product manager for, for whatever it is you're building. You are replacing the, the CEO or the founder of the company, basically. You are the, your tenant that goes there and has all the inside information and all the right the right tools and information to make the right decisions or to report back if, if there's a need. I mean, you are basically replacing the, the, the founder and the person with the vision. And how would you then, when, when you say um, one of the requirements is, is, uh, is the absence of a, is of a big ego, um, is there a certain contradiction to, to founders to finding some, like wh where would you say is the difference then? Uh, or is it exactly the same profile? Look, I, I don't know that you can be so specific as to say everything's exactly the same, but that is the inherent contradiction, right? Absence of a big ego, but the strength of conviction, the belief in yourself, and the ability to back that up. And, and that's why that's not easy to find. But, you know, it, it's, it's good to have a healthy internal ego. It's, it's how it's expressed and managed, which becomes critical there. I think one of the, th sorry. Uh, one of the things that's been mentioned earlier is also to, um, to really define what a win is, you know, not just what game is being played, but part of the, the rules of the game is also, you know, when is, a, when is a game won? So I think it's really hard in the fog of war to sort of, you know, um, sometimes decide whether, you know, something is working or something is not working or, um, you know, and then, you know, it, it doesn't look so bad, you know, it's, it's actually doing okay, but it's, it's very important to beforehand actually define the KPIs. Uh, with the team, with uh, with the, the with the business manager, with the business owner, with the CEO, um, so that everyone is on the same page before you ship something. What success actually uh, constitutes, and um, and then I think it's perfectly cool if you know um, if people feel extreme, or it's part of it that you know people feel very proud and they celebrate a win and they actually you know you, you need to call a win a win, but then also. Um, you, you need to, it needs to be 100, product manager will be 100% accountable also uh, when, it, when it falls short, if the KPIs are, are agreed beforehand. So don't just ship and see, you know, and then sort of try to decide if it works or not, because it will always skew your vision. You really need to set that before. Yeah, to, to place that in context, when, uh, when I see like a team in difficulty or a team that's struggling, one of the biggest obvious warning signs is lack of goals or having the wrong goals. Um, and it's just a surefire sign that things are going wrong. So on success, failure, and resilience, um, some of say the biggest successes or like breakthroughs, these eureka moments I've had with the teams has been after like huge failures or, or progressive failure until you finally make that breakthrough. Um, I'm wondering if you guys can share like one you know, eureka moment when you made this big breakthrough off the back of failure. Well, we had um, uh, just just a tiny feature we had. Uh, it was just idea from, came, uh, coming from from developer. So we built in. It was uh, really easy to develop. It it took I don't know half a day to develop it to get it in the app to launch it in the next release, and um, uh, we even forgot about it. And at some point we had um, we had a weekly um, a weekly meeting about KPIs and numbers. Uh, we are very uh, data driven. And suddenly we had um, a huge curve going up on this feature and it was like, guys, what's going on? And then suddenly we realized that the really tiny idea which was you know, brought by developer, which he's not a product manager, he's not defining the product, but he was thinking about it. He brought himself in the game and suddenly um, he succeed and uh, the whole team succeed. So we were very happy about it. So as a Sometimes very, very small things which uh, really um, makes uh, things going well in the team. Um, my first company um, places, that's um, over, over 10 years ago now, and it was basically similar to, uh, to what then later Foursquare became. Um, so you could check into places and um, be the discoverer of a place, fairly similar to the mayor. And we had a, 
and we had a um, we had a high score um, for how many places people discovered, and it was a complete fun feature. Like we didn't think about it much, right? Uh, it really wasn't a big priority. So you get points for the number of networks you would discover. And when we relaunched, we took that out because we needed to prioritize, and this was clearly not on top of the feature list. And back then, you know, gamification wasn't a big, it wasn't a household name. People, I mean, I've, I hadn't heard about it at that point, and I never really made the connection between, you know, uh, gambling machines and, and, and a service, because, you know, it was all about the value we're providing, right? Meeting friends, you know, seeing how many people have been to that place, and if it's a good restaurant. And then we relaunched, took that feature out, and the numbers were terrible. And it took us three, a couple of days, a couple of weeks, three weeks of digging and really talking to our users to understand what actually happened. And it turns out that the main motivation wasn't the value we were providing. It was really that people uh, wanted to compete over who discovered the most uh, places in, um, in, uh, in their specific city. Um, so it was, that was a very interesting um, Yuriki moment. And, Another one is, is what I'm going to talk about later, so I'm not going to give it away. Um, when, when I finally found a, a KPI that I think um, is a true um, indicator, a true measure for whether a service is working or not, um, um, better than anything else. Actually, the only KPI I'm looking for as an entrepreneur and, um, and investor these days. But I'm not going to give that away. Um, something that I learned like in the early days of doing product management that it never fails to, to catch me again and slap me in the face like in a, in a really huge way is how comfortable you can get with your product and how it can be destroyed in five seconds by a customer. So never forget the power of having actual users testing and using your product in real life. Just go to a conference like this one, take your phone out, let them use it. It's, it's amazing. Like you'll have moments in your life when you're like so happy and proud of it, and you just go out there and here it is. Now, now you try it, and they just, what is this? It is this. This is not doing what it says it does, and it's you. You keep forgetting about it. You should expect that. I mean, it's it's obvious. I mean, you you can never really predict everything, but sometimes you just face the customers, face the users. They look at your product, and one in five are gonna hit a roadblock, and they're gonna be. Uh, this is not doing it for me. And then you'll know it's, it's going gonna, it's gonna to come all over you, it's, and you'll know you failed at that, that specific, specific task. And luckily, you do this before you have a big launch and invest a million dollars. You, you do it with some user testing in real life before, before you do that. I think the thing I'll add, rather than a specific story, is the, the power of data and insights into your product and your user base in, in hitting that eureka moment. Right. And, and often you, you had some success metrics set out for a feature you released or, or new, new product or experience, and you find you're not hitting any of those metrics, everything looks flat and depressing. And as you dig into the data, and you know, sometimes you have to go beyond the metrics you set up and start looking at patterns that are emerging, and you suddenly see a spike somewhere, which is something you weren't looking for that was unexpected. I think any of you who were here last year, one of the things I talked about was the concept of a desire path where landscape architects, they, they plan out a park or something and they have footpaths through it, but then you get these muddy tracks across the grass where people actually walk. And it's not, you know, there, there is a way to get from A to B, but people find another way to get there. And, and those are the key eureka moments in most products as you build them out where your users teach you how they're really going to use it. And so being, being instrumented in your product or service so that you actually have a way to discern that information becomes critical in, in finding out what those potential success paths are when you say, otherwise you look at it and say, hey, no one's using my footpath, they don't want to walk from A to B, and you draw completely the wrong conclusion. Cool. So what we're also doing is every now and then, because um, after one year working on one product, uh, in my case, I was breathing this product, so I know everything, so even if I close my eyes, I can go certain ways. Uh, we are hiring people for two, three days, uh, independent uh, people, just having an audit on our product, telling us, okay, is this UI or UX um, really good or not? Yeah, and uh, it can be better. What is the you know, biggest mistake we did? Because on some point, we are also getting blind uh, to our product. Yeah, yeah. Um, we could actually spend a whole topic talking about how you put the user at the center and, and drive that out. Um, but we have just a little bit of time left for some questions. Um, so, if somebody wants to put that, oh, they can see somebody over there, very keen. Uh, does that we have a microphone? 
Okay, so um, an interesting part, I think, it is that you have to, to take really tough decisions and you have to give, uh, con let's say, construct constructive uh, feedback. How do you manage to do that? Do you have like a, a pattern or a strategy? Do you adapt to the person? How do you do it? Well, I, I think the important thing is that it's not, I mean, you're not the, you're not the boss, right? Um, you're the lubricant, you're part of the team. Um, so I think it's not so much about, you know, giving individual feedback, um, but more about, because, um, yeah, like, you know, you're not the person's boss. It's not, it's, not a, it's not a performance review, right? It's really about sitting together, saying, has this worked, has this not worked? Uh, if not, dig into the data. I mean, it's... it's Ultimately, of course, individual performance matters, but I think you know it's it's that's it's not that's not the important part. Um, you're never as a product manager, you never fail because or say your team failed you as the weakest excuse, right? Um, and a team is always a bunch of people, so there's always a way of oops, a bunch uh, a way of somehow making it work anyway. So I think it's more about sitting together, analyzing what happened, and and then moving on. I, uh, I see it purely as like setting the team focus so that everything we decide on is a team decision. Like I actually don't make decisions anymore. I create the environment and create the methodology so that the team asks the right questions of each other and makes the decisions and then everything is agreed and clear and we move on very fast. Um, did you want to pick up? Or? I was pretty much going to say that. Okay. The, the context and the goals make it actually very easy to give what you call constructive feedback because if everyone's working towards the same thing, and understand what, understands what they're going towards, then it's part and parcel of what you're doing. Mm. Cool. Um, another question? Uh, hi. So you said that in a startup you have to wear uh, both hats, the CEO, founder, and the product manager at the beginning. When is the time when, when you need to separate the two or you need to hire someone else to do the product? Or management. That, that's very easy. It's when you have too much on your hands. <laughs> when you cannot do both anymore, you know, that's a sign, basically. Hello. Uh, so I was wondering what are your thoughts on uh, remote work and how does, uh, if, if you have any experience with remote, remote work, and how uh, do the skills that are needed change in a distributed team? Yeah, it's, it's a very different scenario managing and working with a remote team. I've worked with remote teams in India, China, and Kluge. Um, and it's, it's, it's never easy to function the same way, and you have to change the way you operate. And, and often, from my perspective, the nature of what you can do remotely versus what you can do when the team is local is very different. So it, it tends to be more successful with more project-oriented work. Even with it, within a product company, if you can encapsulate things that can be done as a standalone task, then it's easier for that remote team to work. I think in that context, you still ideally want even a remote team to be set up in a self-managing way, right? It's, it's a fundamental agile principle. I think you have to be careful of doing, being agile versus doing agile, which are two very different things. That's a whole other conversation. But uh, yeah, choo choosing what you do remotely becomes really critical to that. If you're, if you're a startup and you're trying to build things out, I, I do not recommend using a remote team to do that because you won't be able to iterate and make those fast decisions where things are very uncertain, right? You, you don't know what your product is going to be next week, leave alone next year. And if your team is remote and you have to go back and forth for every conversation, you're losing a lot of time and energy in that. I think both is possible. You just have to make up your mind, right? I mean, um, either you're all in one room or you're all distributed and uh, in one chat room, and that's also fine. But even in a small team or in the beginning, but you can't mix these things. They can't be like the two odd people sitting somewhere else, feeling left out, where four other people sit around the the table. So I, the, the, this is actually the situation I have. I'm mixing the both. So I have two uh, lead developers for mobile, one for Android, one for iOS, working directly um, in Berlin, sitting with me. And uh, we have remote um, resources in Cluj, developers. So the first thing what I did when, uh, when we get a team in place, I brought my developer to Cluj to get, um, to get each other, to know each other, to know we are working with people, not just resources, as a people. And meanwhile, I'm just communicating with my lead developers. And you know, I don't care how they split their work. 
Yeah, it's working fine for me, so I can say, okay, I need this, this, and this, and I don't care who is going to, to do it. I just need an ETA, and that's it. Yeah, and it's working fine for me at the moment. I'll, I'll just really quickly, uh, if you wanna, uh, if you wanna work remotely, if that's like, something you prefer as a founder, baby, it's fine. I mean, plenty of people prove it can work. If you do it right, everything, everybody's smart and aligned, and they all, they all go in the same direction and understand the consequences. It's, it's gonna work just fine. Uh, if not everybody is happy, or we have like a, a part of the team in another place that may not work, there's a great book called Rework from the guys that you know it. Okay, then you have your answers. Cool. Okay, we are through with time. Uh, if you do have a question, please come and find one of us and ask us. We'll be around. Yeah. Yes. Thank you very much, guys. I would ask you for like going quickly outside. So if you have like more follow-up questions, because we couldn't take more, just like if you all go quickly after this talk outside, so people can grab you there and um, convince you of staying in Cluj. Um, I think you're already half convinced, so that's, that's the first step, which is important. And Ron is coming back pretty frequently as well. So we already have a two out of five one, and on the other one, we're trying to convince Felix to invest in Cluj as well. So we're trying to get everybody hooked on the ecosystem here. Um, for Chris, we still have to work on a strategy I don't know yet. Maybe we can, you can become like a hotel tester here. Um, <laughs> So, I don't know. So I like traveling. So, work, thanks very much, guys. Much appreciated. Thank you very much, Tush. Thank you.